Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. All right, today on The Less Stressed Life, we have Dr. Amber Walker, who's a physical therapist passionate about public health and chronic illness patient community. She was once completely sidelined by mast cell activation syndrome, and she is now or has now regained her ability to return to career activities and outdoor adventures, thanks to the help of a comprehensive medical team and naturopathic treatment. She advocates for the mast cell activation population with speaking engagements and resources on her website, which is originwellnesscolorado.com. So she is the author of Mast Cells United and a newer book called called the trifecta passport tools for mast cell activation syndrome, postural, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and ehlers Stanlos syndrome. So we'll talk about the relationship between all of these really challenging, um, conditions today. Welcome Amber. Thank you very much. It is truly, uh, an honor to be here and I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah. And so I, um, picked up Amber's book in a late night, Amazon book shopping spree. Mm-hmm. It is a very thick, excellently written book, like a great MD um, practitioner book. The first one is a great MD practitioner book. It is full of science. And so Amber took her background as a scientist, right? As a physical therapist um, and somehow crafted beyond her own story because she was so profoundly affected by this condition, but she, she created just a resource that did not exist before, I think, um, on mast cells. So what I really enjoyed about the book was the first 50 or so pages is her personal story. And there is so much that I think we can all see of ourselves in this story, but here are some things that you may not, um, that may be different. So, uh, I just want to like give some highlights because I don't want you to forget about these interests. Like these were things that I gasped when I was reading. Mm-hmm. Um, so not, not growing up in Alaska, but she talks about growing up in Alaska kind of growing up with allergies as a kiddo, um, being a travel person, being a travel buff, um, running around the world in preparation for the Boston marathon at the end of this trip, getting, um, jumped on by a monkey and getting bitten and kind of getting like incapacitated by that going to the Boston marathon, trying to work through it, but not doing beautifully another trip. She's in Peru and she has later on like a worm coming out of her, (laughs) coming out (laughs) of her leg. I, that was like, Oh, any, Anyway, Amber, I would love for you, we were talking off air about like, it's hard for you to condense the story because it's so dang interesting. But if you're able, we'd love to start there because your story is kind of what pulls us all in. Um, So tell us a little bit about life and health and some of the things that you think kind of contributed overall to the advent of mass cell act. Like what, um, what, what kind of created this storm in your body. Um, tell us the story, start it wherever you want to start. All right. My goodness. Well, <clears throat> thank you for refreshing my memory about those travel experiences. <laughs> Never a dull moment when you go abroad, but, uh, yeah, I definitely had a kind of, uh, the perfect storm of factors. I think like you alluded to growing up, I certainly had a lot of inflammatory things going on. And then into college, I was an athlete and I was a swimmer. So I was kind of hanging out in lots of moldy environments, um, did some work after Katrina and moldy environments. There was a lot of kind of that mold piece that came in and out of my story over the years, but it really did. took me a while to kind of connect the dots there and realizing how much that was impacting my health. Um, there's certainly a lot of other things that had more to do with, uh, gut health. And, and eventually I started collecting kind of into my late twenties and early thirties, this sort of resume, if you will, of health conditions and labels and diagnoses, not the kind of resume I really wanted to have. I'll tell you that, <laughs> but, um, it, it was certainly a journey. I was very blessed to find some great practitioners along the way that helped me uncover a lot of the root issues to why my mast cells were going awry. Um, and, and why, uh, I was having some of these other 
um, kind of multi-system issues in my body. And it all kind of came to a peak when I was living in Washington state for a while, I was living in a very moldy building and I was just having anaphylaxis at the drop of a hat. I mean, I was having these severe mast cell type reactions to driving through farm country, um, to walking by a smoker on the street. Um, and at some points I could even just walk by the outside of a moldy building and was immediately hit by symptoms. Um, so there was definitely that, that thread of mold in there, but I do think once I started to dive deeper with kind of more of a functional minded approach, we started to uncover, you know, everything from SIBO and candida issues and a lot of gut, you know, dysbiosis problems there, uh, some hormonal imbalances, um, even parathyroid issues became a part of the picture and, um, some genetic pieces, certainly hereditary angioedema was one thing I eventually learned about that was kind of a big aha moment for me in terms of some of the attacks or episodes I was going through weren't all necessarily mast cell mediated, but uh, was certainly the perfect storm of factors. Uh, I think, you know, environmental toxins is played, played a huge role. I had some very um, severe vaccine reactions over the years and vaccine injuries. And again, I, I don't think it's ever just one thing. And this is what I see with my clients is it's generally not one thing, but it's kind of that soup, that, that perfect storm that sets up. Yeah. It's a lot of pieces. So, and I mean, I want to jump straight to like, it's kind of hard to address these things when you can't take stuff because you react to everything, but maybe we should lay the land out. If you're listening to this, you may have already been attracted to it because you kind of know what mast cell activation syndrome or disorder is, but will you give us the kind of the best definition that we have at the moment? Um, so what is mast cell? um, activation syndrome, um, how prevalent is it? Or like, how long does it take for someone to get a diagnosis or what diagnostic criteria are there? And then we can talk about how it's traditionally treated. Absolutely. Yeah. That's kind of a loaded question. Um, but let's see here. <laughs> well, I start by saying, you know, if we just break it down to the mass cell level, what is a mass cell? Um, mass cells in our body are present in almost all of our tissues. It's a type of white blood cell. It's a type of immune cell that's sort of like an immune system watchdog. Um, and so it has the ability to have different things bind to its receptors and release as a result, uh, a variety of different chemical mediators in the body that can lead to different types of responses, um, throughout all of our tissues and especially commonly found in kind of our boundary tissue, the tissues that are in close contact with the outside world. Um, a lot of the chemical mediators that are released by these cells, are, um, I mean, there's hundreds of them when we look at the research, but the ones that are more sort of notorious or commonly talked about would be things like histamine. Um, many people are familiar with antihistamines or uh, the even the concept of histamine intolerance nowadays. So that's, that's one of the more notorious ones, but there are a lot of other uh, mediators that are released that can cause inflammation in the body on sort of a global or systemic level. But typically when it comes to sort of the terminology here, we have this umbrella term called mast cell activation disease, MCAD, which is this umbrella term that talks about kind of two things that can happen. Either we can have basically an accumulation of pathological mast cells in organs and tissues, or we might have a normal sort of number of mast cells in the body, but they're hypersensitive to their environment. So they're releasing these chemical mediators essentially when we don't really have a true threat to us or when we shouldn't be having that happen. Um, so mast cell activation syndrome is sort of a, a subset of mast cell activation disease that is much more common. Uh, there are other types like mastocytosis that are um, typically uh, less common in the population. And there's certainly some cancerous type subsets, but the majority of people uh, that I see kind of walking around that have these types of sensitivities and reactions have mast cell activation syndrome. And that is, again, that's that um, state of hypersensitive mast cells reacting to things uh, when they shouldn't. In other words, being allergic to everything, kind of. Yeah, essentially. For a lot of people, it does show up that way. Now, it, it's not all anaphylaxis and, and allergies, though. There are a lot of other symptoms, virtually every system of the body that can um, arise. And so for some people it's, it's more kind of lung or heart manifestations for some people, it's more gastrointestinal, for some people it's more the skin, et cetera. Um, so you name it, the, you can kind of trace back virtually any system to mast cells, which makes it tricky. Um, because I don't think you want to necessarily 
um, blame the mast cell on everything, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think it is important to have an awareness that this can be occurring. So uh, what have you seen as far as, I mean, it seems like this will build up for people over time and then it gets a bit out of control. And I don't know if there is diagnostic criteria where people are getting a good diagnosis in any short amount of time. Um, once upon a time, I think I had heard it was like seven years. Then there's a lot of conditions like that, but what you're seeing maybe in your population, we can just go from that. Um, is it a long road to get help and to get diagnosis and how are people usually treated for this conventionally? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, it can be a very long road for many people, decades of of suffering and mysterious symptoms. And when you start to connect the dots and look back at your own history, you often see things that were there since birth that kind of fit into this potential picture. But in terms of the, the kind of the conventional medical system diagnosis of this, it's, it's tough because there are a couple of different groups of uh, physicians and researchers who have put together these diagnostic criteria for this condition. It's not really well recognized in the medical community yet. Um, we think we do have ICD-10 codes now, <laughs> but didn't always, but it's certainly a newer kind of label. And there's, um, not a lot of providers who are familiar with it yet, but that being said, the, the diagnosis is typically made based on, um, several factors. So there's some, sort of some major criteria and minor criteria. The most recent publications talk about having symptoms that are consistent with max cell, mast cell activation in multiple organs plus elevation of one or more of these mast cell mediators that we can measure um, either in the blood or urine. Typically those tests are to be honest, um, not super reliable. A lot of them need very specific instructions with the laboratories in terms of um, the temperature that the urine needs to be kept at and the speed of the test. And so we often get false negatives. And a lot of people can have this on their radar and go through the testing for years before they actually capture an elevated marker. So it's definitely not um, easy or ideal. And then um, it, depending on the, the kind of the, the field and the, the practitioners, which approach they follow, some of these experts also recommend having some tissue biopsies and looking at those uh, for other signs of this condition. Um, whereas another kind of school will kind of look more at genetic mutations um, in uh, either the kit mutation or like the there's the um, hereditary uh, alpha tryptasemia, which has kind of come out more recently. And so there's some other things that people will look at. Uh, but, but often people are also given this label with, um, you know, depending on the practitioner with a lot of signs and, and things that fit this and a process of ruling out some of the other conditions that can mimic it. But it is difficult because the symptoms are so uh, sort of um, broad. Yeah. Why it's nature. Um, well, and, and on that note, let's talk about how you, you know, kind of your di diagnosis um, overall, if we can go back to that, because your experience might help kind of pull back that curtain a little bit. Um, what were, I'm sure you had seen the providers for a lot of different things, but when was it kind of at this point where it was very flared, um, where a provider said, I think you have this, or maybe you had already discovered that on your own. Mm -hmm. I don't recall that from your story. Yeah. Well, I, uh, was very fortunate to start working with a functional primary care type physician. And she actually wasn't uh, familiar with MCAS, uh, or mast cell activation syndrome. I'll probably just be keep calling it MCAS. Um, <laughs> but she did kind of, um, allude to this, this concept of histamine intolerance. So that was kind of my first um, curiosity about this area is she said, you know, you have a lot of signs of histamine intolerance. Have you ever tried the low histamine diet? Um, and so I kind of went down that rabbit hole for a little while. And I actually did the opposite at one point and tried a high histamine diet to test her theory, which ended terribly for me for a number of weeks, but, um, <laughs> Um, and that kind of clued me a little bit more into, okay, I think she's onto something here. I think I do have an issue with histamine. As I started to research it, I found Dr. Afrin's book and some other resources that um, increased my awareness of this. And then I actually um, followed up and just asked to be tested 
for MCAS um, based on some of the reading I had done. And I was very, I was one of the lucky few where the first round of testing came back positive. And then I had some biopsies from my gastrointestinal um, from a previous colonoscopy that they actually stained and tested after the fact for these mast cell signs, uh, which helped kind of solidify it for me. So um, I, I think I actually got pretty lucky in yeah. terms of how quickly I came to this conclusion with well, it. Well, there's nothing worse. I think that's the problem for people is that they're, it's really defeating to have everything wrong and then to not really understand why everything is wrong. And so even if the name of the condition isn't much of a start, it tends to make people feel better because something was positive, right? When Mm -hmm. maybe other testing was negative. And so a lot of times we just put a ton of faith in the diagnosis. I, I see that with people all the time. And so maybe you do too. It's like, it's, it's like they can stop climbing up the hill and maybe now go across or down the hill once they sort of have something to work on. Absolutely. I think that is so, so common. And it's sort of, for me, it was like this, this immense relief at having that validation of knowing that I wasn't crazy (laughs) and that there was something that explained all of these symptoms that were all over my body um, that didn't seem to add up or have any rhyme or reason to them. But I think that was also followed for me by a kind of a a season of um, discouragement at realizing, well, this is great. I have this label and I finally have this validation, this understanding, but like, why, why is this happening in my body? How do I, what are the root issues for it? And so that's where, you know, again, diving into kind of the, the root issue approach with a practitioner who can um, investigate those other areas is so, so empowering for patients because you can, um, not just sort of succumb to the mainstream idea of, okay, we'll just take all these mast cell, um, medications, which I'm not poo-pooing that idea by any means. Some people really need that to get stable, but I think after somebody reaches a stable baseline, it's really helpful for them to dive a little deeper into kind of the functional natural medicine world to understand why is this hyper sensitivity here in the, pro- in the, in the first place, why, what's going on with my detox pathways, what's going on with some of these potential, uh, triggers and root issues. Um, and that's, that's for me is, is the art of this and the beauty of it is when you can get to that point past the diagnosis of MCAS, which is really just a label, um, and, and understand the why there, um, that's when we can see the reversal of so many of the symptoms. Well, and I do want to talk about how you started climbing out of that hole because the challenge is, as you said, it would be fine to address all of the problems if you could tolerate the treatment. And that's Mm -hmm. where the problem is, is that you're hypersensitive to what feels like almost everything. And so I want to talk about that next, but I know that that's a rabbit hole. So first, while we're kind of qualifying um, the condition or MCAS overall, there are other conditions that you'll see it overlap with all the time. And I'm wondering if you'll tell us a little bit about why that is. So some of these include Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, if you want to tell us about what that is. Um POTS, post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I mean, you literally put those in the tagline of your new book, right? So those are the ones that I feel are like very specific to under that umbrella of MCAS. Um, Why do we see those show up in conjunction with MCAS Mm -hmm. all the time? And what do they look like? Yeah. Wonderful question. That's another loaded question. Um, Mm -hmm. The why, (laughs) (laughs) right? (laughs) I love it. Um, I think the why, if we zoom out and kind of take like a, um, you know, 20,000 foot view here, the commonalities I see when people come in and they do have some of these other conditions often comes back to toxic burden and what's going on with detoxification. And when we start to do some things, whether that's following a a program to address mold or something else, another type of toxin, I often see the symptoms of POTS reverse completely. And I often see the flare ups and the inflammation associated with hypermobile EDS go down dramatically. Um, there's a lot of connections and theories out there and in terms of how these different conditions are related, but I guess I should explain what they are. So, um, POTS is, uh, like you said, postural or orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's a type of dysautonomia. And so essentially what occurs with this condition is people have this spike in their heart rate when they change in a position that is not accompanied by a drop in blood pressure 
pressure at the same time. So it's not orthostatic hypotension, it's different. And um, there's various types of POTS. I probably won't go into too much detail of that today, but essentially um, this can be accompanied by a lot of other symptoms that are kind of systemic. Um, Some people do have fainting or near fainting in conjunction with these episodes. Um, A lot of gastrointestinal issues, a lot of other things that kind of go hand in hand with that. Um, And it can really limit that person's ability to be upright, to stand, to walk, to exercise, uh, to really to function in daily life. So POTS POTS can be extremely debilitating uh, for people. There's uh, the other condition that we started talking about is uh, I, I'll call it HEDS, uh, which is the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now there's a whole bunch of different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and the majority of the different types are um, do have genetic mutations that are responsible for them. HEDS is the one that is less understood or um, less associated with a genetic mutation at this point in time, although there's still some research coming out on that. So it's a disorder where we see um, sort of a global um, hypermobility of the joints and uh, laxity of the different connective tissues uh, from defects in collagen. So um, the connections, I guess it, it's complex and that sometimes it's hard to tell what came first, the chicken or the egg with some of these overlapping conditions. Um, but there are a lot of connections between sort of this vicious cycle with that mast cell activation piece coming into play uh, with the dysautonomia symptoms and sort of this, um, global inflammation that we tend to see in different joints and tissues with EDS. Mm. With POTS, just the way that kind of manifests, it feels like mineral imbalances as well. Um, this is just my like quick little Mm -hmm. rabbit hole. Do you find like, would you say, yeah, I feel like I see that as part of the root causes of POTS or is that like, nope, there's too many big, Krista, you're not, uh, you're not barking up quite the right tree here. I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I have, I think by the time I see people, they're usually pretty malnourished or have a lot of intestinal absorption issues that play into this. So I think, yeah, there is a huge connection with gut health. I think there's a huge condition with, uh, or sorry, connection, I should say, with structural concerns, whether that's craniocervical instability, which is common in these hypermobility spectrum disorders, whether that's uh, intracranial pressure issues or Chiari malformation, or some of these other things that can occur that can impact, um, you know, from a structural perspective, the, even just the upper cervical alignment and how that impacts some of our cranial nerves. I think that there's a lot of, of overlap in terms of how all of these conditions are at play at the same time. But I do see clinically the thing that I've found to be the most profound for reversing POTS in my clinical experience. This is not based on research, just clinical observation is honestly um, working on detox and getting mold or other types of toxins out of the system. For most people, their POTS goes away. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my clinical perspective there, but I do think it is more complicated than just removing toxins. Absolutely. And a lot of conventional treatment of POTS is, you know, medication-based and compression stockings and hydration. And I think those are honestly kind of band-aids, but if we can look for the root issue of why it's there in the first place, we tend to see a better long-term results. Well, there's a lot of ways I can go from here and I want to go all the ways. Um, you brought (laughs) up, you brought up something that, um, I think is really important and you're very specifically, um, the, the, the right person to be in this place, um, being a physical therapist, because you talked about structural alignment things. And I do, I actually want to spend a bit of time talking about that because as someone who works with largely internal things, I always give, um, I always give space or acknowledgement to that. We cannot, uh, uh, we also have to um, appreciate and maybe consider what are our options structurally, externally, and then also our emotional um, angle, as well as the nutritional angle or what is going on on the inside. Um, to start this conversation though, we've got this hypersensitivity and it would be great if we could treat these things like mold, if you could tolerate things, or mm-hmm. let's say kind of like the last person I was working with like this, you know, everything we wanted to use. She's like, well, I have an issue with sulfur or I have an issue with this and I have an issue with this. 
Um, and largely, yes, mold is probably at the root of this, but when you were at your height of hypersensitivity, how did you start climbing out of the hole? Or if you want to use not your example, what you wish you'd have done instead, um, Uh how, you know, there are some options conventionally for stabilization, but that's the, that's the emergency, the negative emergency point for people that are experiencing MCAS is the, the hypersensitization and the fact that they actually can't go through a day without Mm -hmm. feeling like their life is threatened. So how can we climb out of the hole for stabilization first? Yes, that is such an important question. And I think for like a little perspective of what the hole looks like, you know, for, for me and my body, when I was there, I had kind of gone down the slippery slope of less and less tolerance to foods to the point where I had like three or four safe foods. I mean, there were three or four food options I could do every day. Um, and I was reacting to everything else, which is a scary place to be. And then the same with supplements and medications, I couldn't really tolerate anything new. It was almost an immediate anaphylaxis spectrum, you know, type reaction. So, you know, you're right. When, what do you do when you're, you're there or your patient is there where they're really not tolerating some of the, you know, great tools we have in functional medicine and natural medicine. What if you can't take anything? What if you can't try anything dietarily? And so I think what I try to uh, focus on with clients and what has also helped me get out of that hole is really kind of circling back to the basics with the nervous system. And we know there's huge connections with the limbic system and sort of our perception, our emotional perception of things that are going on and, and, um, the hypervigilance that can occur when our, uh, nervous system becomes dysregulated. And of course there's also the, the trauma piece, which plays into this quite a bit. And so I think when I work with clients who are really kind of stuck in terms of not being able to tolerate those things, we always, always start with a good foundation of um, the nervous system. And so kind of coming into a little bit of education on the polyvagal theory and, how, what are some tools that you can do, um, whether it's exercises or other strategies, something that doesn't involve a supplement or a food to help your nervous system shift into that ventral vagal tone. And, um, that's a huge part of the work I do with people early on, on which, um, at the beginning, I didn't always start there, but I think it's, it's become clear that it's, it's really helpful at that point. Um, there are other ways to support detox that are topical or, um, are other, things you can do sort of in your environment that can also be, you know, beneficial for getting out of that hole. Um, another tool that I really like to use is something called craniobiotic technique, which is um, where this is an in-person skill, but you basically stimulate neurovascular reflex points and do some muscle testing. And um, there's a gentle pressure on the head that you use in conjunction with that to help lock the nervous and the immune system on to sort of triage. What's the biggest priority there. Um, and that can sometimes expand people's options. And then the other thing I think that's really helpful that I've had personal experience with, of course, first was the safe and sound protocol. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with that. I'm not. I'd love for you to talk about it. It's uh, basically a strategy that uh, is based again from kind of Dr. Porges work on the polyvagal theory, uh, where it's an auditory therapy that has special frequencies and tones embedded into the music. And so it's uh, basically listening to about five hours of music spread out over an extended time frame uh, in conjunction with specific exercises that you can do. So it's kind of like a bottom-up approach for the nervous system. There's some great programs out there like DNRS or the Gupta program. Those require quite a bit of a time commitment. And, and um, for some people, you know, and I think they recommend an hour a day for the first six months or something like that. So that's kind of more that top-down approach, which can be super valuable. But I think for some people, um, kind of easing in with a different angle with this auditory therapy can be helpful uh, without triggering trauma. Um, and so working with a practitioner who's trained in it and knows how to kind of utilize it with people is really helpful. It's not something you can just go online and start listening to you do need to, you know, work one-on-one with somebody to access that. Um, what was the doctor who created it? What was his name? Uh, Stephen Porges. Yeah. How do you spell he that? is incredible. He has several books out, does a lot of speaking and education at different events. Um, and then Deb Dana is another one who has a few books out on this topic, who is also um, very, very helpful in terms of um, connecting some of these dots in the practical application of the safe and sound protocol. How do you spell Purges? Uh, P-O-R-G-E-S. All right, cool. 
And then there's a great book as well called uh, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve by Stanley Rosenberg that I find is a wonderful starting place uh, that I try to have my clients tap into if they like to read. has a lot of exercises in there as well that are kind of vagus nerve focused that really pair well with this approach. So I want to go back. I want to like take us back and reemphasize this and talk about it a little bit more because this is your specialty area. And this I feel like is the best and maybe only option when someone is reacting to everything is, you know, what can people externally do? And would you put all of this under the neuroplasticity umbrella? What would you call the umbrella of these, um, exogenous external therapies. I think you called it like nervous system work overall and Mm -hmm. trying to work on getting the nervous system, um, retrained for going down the parasympathetic pathways more commonly, but I'd love for us to like back up and talk about that big picture. You went, you did talk about it and you talked about it quickly, but it's such an important piece for people who have been chronically ill for so long. And you're giving, some good um, options in addition to some of the programs that we refer to all the time, like DNRS and Gupta, which like you said, have a time commitment. So let's talk about all of the options for kind of retraining the nervous system or that big picture um, and kind of like what we are essentially, and you called it a, you know, you mentioned a bottom-up approach. So tell us like literally what's firing and how that changes things. So in the body. So it creates this calmer, safer place where the body stops freaking out and stops having an, like an, an immune system. I don't know what else to call it besides a freak out, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. please yeah. stop freaking out immune system. Like tell us about, um, tell us a little bit more about all of these exogenous therapies that you employ. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think, <clears throat> I guess I often refer to it as nervous system retraining but at the same time, I don't know if the word retraining is that exactly accurate when we're talking about neuroplasticity. Um, some people call it, uh, you know, like rebalancing, you could say, I guess maybe that's a better word, but, um, yeah, I mean, kind of coming back to the tools in the box here, it, it's always kind of step one in increasing awareness of where that individual is at on what we, I call the polyvagal ladder. So we have, um, and this is, this is, I believe Deb Dana and Stephen Poor just talk about the latter in their work. Um, but basically that ventral vagal state with the vagus nerve is that pathway where we feel safe and calm and connected with others and uh, grounded. And that's kind of the, the rest and digest of our traditional medical training, right? Um, now, I learned in school that there's either rest and digest or fight or flight. Um, that was a very simplified version of this, but really the poly- polyvagal theory kind of expands on that. Um, to talk about this other state called freeze or the dorsal vagal pathway, which is kind of the back branch of the vagus nerve that can lead to feeling immobilized, collapsed, shut down, um, depressed, lethargic, kind of stuck, frozen. And so I think when it comes to chronic illness, I see that state be very subtle, but it's very, very common for people to be stuck in that. And so the goal of a lot of these modalities is to help one kind of bring up the lights and raise awareness of where am I at on that? that spectrum or that continuum? Am I, do I tend to gravitate more to to fight or flight? Am I more in freeze or do I oscillate? And then kind of having a curious awareness and observation of that. And then kind of going into what are some simple things I can do to kind of self-soothe the system and and, um, bring myself back into that ventral label place that we want. So uh, a lot of the things I work with on people have to do with um, tactile and kind of sensory exercises that I'll teach people to help self-soothe the nervous system or shift from the state that they're in. Um, so there's not a lot of names or programs per se. It's just stuff I've collected over the years from various resources of um, exercises that people can apply. Certainly breath work plays a big role here. And I think that's another powerful tool um, as well as some other physical exercises you can do. And then tying this back into the structural piece. Again, there's a huge connection with the cervical spine and the alignment there. So making sure that, um, you know, the alignment is, is proper, um, can really have a profound impact on the nervous system and the limbic system and kind of how some of these reactions that occur. And so educating people in some of those tools is really helpful. There's so much out there, honestly, if you start to look at these programs in terms of auditory therapy alone, there's all sorts of things. Brain tap is a popular one. There's vagus nerve stimulators. There's 
um, these, these, again, more, these approaches that are more course based, which I think can be very powerful for people. Um, and even meditation can be helpful for some people. I think when people hear meditation, um, if they've tried it a few times and haven't had the best experience, or if they get triggered by it, um, you know, certainly need to work with a practitioner who can guide you a little bit more carefully there, but there's just so many tools in the box for the nervous system once you start to dive into it. So I love talking about this topic because it feels, I think we always think it feels too simple. Um, so I like to talk about the science behind it and all of the tools and options and how they are not very costly, right. In theory, Mm -hmm. right. They're Mm -hmm. not very costly. What are two little things that, that you have someone maybe start with? You said there's some sensory exercises you give people to help kind of self-soothe the nervous system. What does that do? Um, instead of the nervous system kind of like boomeranging on itself. And I want you to correct me. This is just my interpretation. It's sort of helping you center and put, um, the focus elsewhere. Is that what I'm understanding? And then on that same note, Um, there's other options where, you know, some people I was talking to someone yesterday and she was talking about body scanning, which is really turning the attention on, oh, my feet is, my feet are touching the ground. My breath is doing this. So, um, tell me about a couple of things that you have people do for sensory exercises and kind of what happens to help calm the system there. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're right. The way you just expressed that kind of getting centered or grounded in in that ventral vagal tone is the goal of these exercises. So no matter where you're at, whether you're kind of more in that sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight type state, or whether you're kind of down in that dorsal vagal collapsed frozen zone, um, these exercises should help shift your nervous system. And it might not get you all the way to the top of the ladder where you want to be there, but it can certainly, um, move you in the right direction and, and having awareness of that is key. So a couple of the exercises, I think, um, I mean, I don't want to make everybody go out and buy a book, but there's this basic exercise, which is, uh, in Stanley Rosenberg's Vegas nerve book. That's, um, basically using head positioning and hand positioning and eye movement to help realign the cervical spine. That one is very, very powerful for, for people, as long as it's done gently in the right way. I think that one's very helpful. So having a structural exercise in the mix and not just the breath work or not just the sensory tactile work. Um, I, I tend to find that huge connections. I mean, even, um, individuals who have had concussions in the past, this can also be really helpful for things like that. Um, so there's just a lot of overlap in, in focusing on some of that cervical alignment and, um, that piece can be profoundly helpful. Um, but other simple ones, uh, I think that breath work can be really powerful. And like you said, there's this kind of stigma that, well, this nervous system stuff seems so simple and basic and, you know, is this really doing anything? And, um, but I think once you really get into it, even something like alternate nostril breathing or some uh, box breathing or some of these other things that you could like YouTube and learn how to do yourself at home can be, uh, very, very helpful when they're done the wrong way, as long as you're focusing on that long exhale to kind of get your system into that ventral vagal tone. Uh, so those are a couple of the ones I like to utilize. There's, there's a lot of tactile ones that involve, um, like a self hug or rocking or some, um, trigeminal nerve, uh, type tactile exercises that I think are helpful as well. So, well, before we leave this topic, you mentioned a word that I feel like gets thrown around a little bit in the MCAS world, which is limbic system. So tell us about, give a little bit more love to the limbic system and what that is. Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, there are books just on this for a reason. It's pretty profound (laughs) when you start to learn more about it, but essentially um, we, as humans, we are constantly on a subconscious level scanning our environment to figure out if our system is safe. And so we have different structures in the brain that are involved with that. I'm going to just make this a very simple explanation, but um, essentially as we're scanning our environment, um, different processes are occurring and we're stimulating sort of these chain reactions to happen based on our perception of whether we're safe or not. Um, And so we can have some kind of um, improper wiring, so to speak, occur if we've had trauma or whether we've been, let's say in a moldy building for a while and and we start to make these subconscious associations. And so then every time we're around that type of a trigger, um, it can send us into sort of a spiral from those subconscious emotional connections that impact our nervous system, that impact our mast cells, kind of or all of the above. Um, and so I think 
um, it's, it's very helpful to have that on your radar, um, especially if you find yourself in a place where you or your client is stuck um, with limited, you know, food options and limited uh, tolerance to different supplements or medications to um, check in with that area and do some of this nervous system work to see if you can rebalance that out differently. Yeah. I love that. So these are great things for digging out of the hole when you're reacting to everything. Um, you can't react. Well, you can, you can react negatively to breath work, but the, you're less likely to do that than, um, than a supplement if you're having a reaction to everyone, everything. So was this kind of also where you had to start to help dig you out? Was this a huge piece of helping you dig out of the hole? Would you say? Yeah, I think in my own journey, I, I circled around to some of these strategies later than, than I, um, could have, I guess if I could go back and do it differently, I would have, um, tapped into these resources sooner. Um, they were always kind of on the to-do list. Uh, but I was fortunate in that I, I was able to tolerate a little bit of binding work, um, earlier on to get some of the mold out of my system. And from there, a lot of more possibilities opened up for me and I was able to tolerate a lot more of sort of the, the functional natural approaches. So in my personal experience, that was definitely helpful. Um, just kind of focusing on detox early on and getting, getting some things out. <laughs> um, and it was definitely powerful for me. And everyone is different, but I do like to talk about what you see for turnaround on people implementing some of these exogenous therapies, nervous system work, and how soon can they start to see a little bit of a difference? Have you experienced mm -hmm. in your clients? Oh, it is so variable. And it, it, um, you know, when it comes to the approaches like the safe and sound protocol, that auditory therapy, it depends on the age of the client too, and sort of some of their backgrounds. Um, with children, we see that a little bit more nervous system plasticity, and we see some of the changes even within the same day of starting some of these approaches. Uh, with adults, sometimes it can take longer, or you might see the results months after you stop the auditory therapy. So for that particular tool, I would say there's a huge spectrum. Um, well, it's kind of a huge spectrum for everything though. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends on on a lot of variables. If somebody is still living in an environment where they're exposed to a lot of biotoxins, for example, it's going to really alter the timeline um, compared to somebody who has a historical exposure. So uh, there's a lot of factors, but I would say, you know, when it comes to mold, for example, and some people will feel better in a matter of weeks of starting things. Um, but we typically are working together for, you know, six months or a year, depending on what other areas we dive into, because it's never just mold or it's never just one thing. You know, we also want to work on gut health and hormones and, um, you know, detox and mitochondrial support and so many other angles to kind of put the puzzle together. So uh, there's different phases to it, but I would say people generally get those glimmers of hope uh, within the first six months of starting to work on these things. Mm -hmm. Man, we could go off on a lot of other things, but I do want to give a little bit of lip service to something you've mentioned several times and what you have seen, like reading your story is super fun just because it's a, a lot of things. Um, but you said, you know, things kind of really came to a head when you realized you had that mold exposure. Have you seen mold be a big thing for the majority of your clients dealing with these hyperimmune issues? Yes, uh, it has been very eye-opening how many individuals have that history, whether it's historical or whether they're currently exposed to mold. It's um, I would estimate, and this is a guesstimate, but you know, probably ninety percent of the people I work with who have muscle activation issues or concerns and/or POTS and/or HES do also have. Um, a mold toxicity issue going on where they aren't able to excrete and remove those, those uh, mycotoxins the way um, we should. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, very big variable in my experience. And a lot of people come in and they also have Lyme disease and it's trying to kind of weed out, you know, um, sometimes people are faced with, do I treat Lyme or mold or both, or how do I navigate this? And um, I'll just tell you, my clinical experience has been that a lot of people don't get better from Lyme either until they address the mold piece. So it's, it's profoundly um, impactful for a lot of the people I work with. I've been having um, quite the re 
realign then on how I feel about mold. I would always say, I don't want to touch that topic because it is, I mean, like you are doing this interview from a hotel room right now because, <laughs> because, of you know, yep. some potential mold stuff. Um, and it can just be kind of an overwhelming topic, but I've seen it become be such a big thing in such a small amount for people and, and change such significant symptoms for them that I'm kind of reevaluating how I'd been approaching it. I've been addressing it in when things are a hot mess, you know, like they can be an MCAS, but sometimes things aren't a hot mess. They're just really annoying, you know, like something's really Mm -hmm. annoying and nagging. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's some things that have kind of helped me come full circle on that, but some of the mentors I'm looking at say, it's not, you know, if it's when you'll have some mold exposure and how significant is it and how, you know, how much is it affecting you? So there will be more to come on the podcast about mold without a doubt, um, in hopefully a non-scary way. (laughs) Yeah. I think it can be a rabbit hole. And I always tell people, I try not to operate with mold goggles on, on, you know, I think it's one part of the pie, one part of the bucket, however you want to look at it. But it's a very powerful one. And it, the, the beauty of it is we, we know what to do with buildings. It's rarely done correctly, but in theory, we know what to do there. And we know what to theory. do to treat mold <laughs> in theory. And it works when it's done properly. And so I think it's something that's often overlooked by people or, or kind of um, dismissed by a lot of medical providers in terms of how much it can impact people. Uh, but it, it is something good to have on the radar for sure. Yeah. It's definitely not mainstream. Yeah. We could probably, we could probably all open our arms to making it a little bit more mainstream and a little less, um, not so fringy, you know, and have more resources Mm -hmm. for it. I think that would help as well. So just kind of accepting that it's a real issue, um, and not sticking our noses in the sand. It'd be a good first, good, good first step for all of us. (laughs) Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for all these personal experiences and I probably wouldn't have it on my radar as much. So I think that like many practitioners out there, that's why we get passionate about these fields as we, we go through it and suddenly we kind of get it (laughs) and understand yeah. Um, as having a little science experiments in our own bodies can teach us. So, yeah, that's one way to think about it. Uh, Amber, where can people find you online? Um, so I have a couple of websites. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about my practice, it's origin wellness, Colorado.com and origin is spelled O R I G I N. And I also have a patient resource website called mastcellsunited.com that has a blog and a bunch of other content as well as a list of providers who offer telehealth with expertise in this area. So those are probably the the best ways to reach me. And you can also email me from those sites. Perfect. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.